I would like to uh, remind people not to text or take phone calls during the presentation. And then to thank our sponsor, the Gazette Newspapers, the Grunion Gazette and the Downtown Gazette. So now I um, would like to welcome Dr. Heidi Cullen, who will talk about public perceptions of climate change. Dr. Cullen is Vice President for External Communications for Climate Central, a nonprofit science journalism organization headquartered in Princeton, New Jersey. She also serves as a research scientist for the organization and reports as a correspondent on climate and energy issues for several national television programs, including PBS NewsHour. Before joining Climate Central, Dr. Cullen served as the Weather Channel's first on-air climate expert and helped create Forecast Earth, a weekly television series focused on issues related to climate change in the environment and a show that I know we miss in our household very much. Prior to that, Dr. Cullen worked as a research scientist for the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, at Boulder, and she received the NOAA's Climate and Global Change Fellowship, spent two years at Columbia University International Research Institute for Climate and Society. She earned her PhD in climatology and ocean atmospheric dynamics at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. Dr. Cullen is a member of the American Geophysical Union and the American Meteorological Society. She is an associate editor of the journal Weather Climate Society and also serves as a member of NOAA Science Advisory Board. She's a visiting lecturer at Princeton University and the author of The Weather of the Future, which will be available for sale after the lecture, and Heidi will be signing copies. So it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Heidi Cullen. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, all right. So thanks so much for coming out tonight, and I'm so sad that Jerry is sick. Uh, I know Jerry very well, and I just can't imagine him sitting still for very long, so I'm sure it's killing him to be sick. <laughs> so I am more or less going to talk tonight about how do you see an issue like climate change? Um, I think it's one of these issues that's really tough to kind of wrap your head around. And um, I start with this image of ice sheets, because actually when you poll the American public and you ask them what image they think of when they think of global warming, melting ice sheets is the image that comes most quickly to mind. And you know, I guess as a scientist who's been working on this issue for a really long time, it's it's so much bigger than that. The, you know, climate change really, when you get to it, is a question of how do we all fit on the planet as we move forward, consuming energy and resources. So it it it's kind of like it's 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 a big whopper of a problem, and it's 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 hard to see it in all of its manifestations because it trickles down in so many ways. So. We're going to talk a little bit about how we see it and then, and then work through the science as well. So, you know, how do scientists see it? You know, this is, this is essentially why climate scientists are worried about the issue of global warming. And that is, by the end of the century, you know, we should be somewhere between 3 and 11 degrees warmer, depending on how we choose to burn energy, um, how quickly we do it, you know, how well we diversify our energy portfolio. And... You know, basically, there's there's uncertainty to that range, which makes it an even trickier problem to communicate from a, a, a classic risk communication standpoint. It's, it's got a lot of uncertainty associated with it. And it's also, you know, it's about more than just temperature, obviously. We see it, as scientists, we see it in this way as, as increasing temperature over time. But, you know, it has all of these different offshoots. I mean, you know, being here at the edge of the Pacific Ocean at a beautiful aquarium, you know, obviously the, the issue of ocean acidification is a huge component of this. And a lot of, of oceanographers that I talk to and coral reef experts call ocean acidification the silent problem. It's one of those problems that doesn't even really get much discussion. And there was a, a paper published just yesterday, the embargo lifted, where some scientists actually quantified we gave the best potential estimate of at what point, at what warming level, the Greenland ice sheet is locked into melting. And, you know, it's kind of one of these tipping point questions. You know, how much do you have to turn up the heat to guarantee that the Greenland ice sheet is going to melt? And they came 
They came up basically with an estimate of about three degrees Fahrenheit, 1.6 degrees Celsius, to lock in the fact that the Greenland ice sheet will melt. That's, you know, that's then leading us into this, this discussion of sea level rise, another huge issue, right? And now the timing of these things is, is tricky. So you know, it's not to say that the Greenland ice sheet will melt next week if we warm the planet three degrees. It's to say that you know, over several centuries, it's going to warm, but you can't turn it off. How do you stop an ice sheet from melting when the planet warms up? So you know, this is why scientists are worried. But the question is, how do you communicate that? So I'm going to show you a clip, and I, I'm going to assume you guys know what the onion is, right? Okay, it's not serious. It's meant to, to give you at least a laugh. This is the Onion News Network. Report first, ask questions later. Now, let's look into a somewhat perplexing story from the world of science. People are reporting that climatologists around the country have been behaving very strangely recently. Let's go to Andrea Bennett in Cambridge, Massachusetts for more. Hello, Andrea. What's going on? Well, Brooke, we just don't know. Something definitely seems to have spooked the climatologists here. They've been pacing around, gesticulating wildly and making a lot of strange noises. Well, I hate to see them all agitated, but these little professors sure do look funny flailing their skinny little weak arms and pushing their glasses back up. Yes, I suppose. And what is that chattering sound that they're making, Andrea? Can we listen to a little more of that? Well, it's similar to their normal vocalizations, but about a third faster and twice as loud. When sea level does cross a threshold, it's very difficult to reverse that rise. So Again, we're not sure why, but it's definitely not the first time we've witnessed this sort of behavior among various different types of scientists. Now, Andrea, don't some people believe that scientists can actually sense danger coming? Oh, I mean, right. do you think that that might have something to do with the way that they're acting? Well, there are those who believe that or mm -hmm. think scientists can tell when someone has cancer or is going to die. But of course, other people think that's pretty silly. Now, as far as climatologists there in Cambridge, I understand that they've actually been approaching humans. Is that right? That is. Now, they're usually very timid, but one came right up to me today. I am not lying. He was this close and handed me this. Amazing. Well, maybe someday we'll know what all this jumping around is all about. Thanks yes. so much, Andrea. You bet. You know, so needless to say, maybe we could be a little bit better about talking about it. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of challenges to communicating the issue well, but I thought that just kind of summarized it at least nicely in some ways. So, you know, we're going to talk about climate change, but, you know, it... It, I feel like the issue is about more than just climate science, right? So when I, when I work you through the next series of slides, I mean, I think maybe what I'm really trying to, to, to bring up is, is a discussion of the role of science, the role of the media, and the role of journalism, and the role of government in many ways, because this is one of those issues that is connected to, to everything. And, and it's an issue that, you know, Everyone has to sort of be part of solving, and, and so you can't really talk about the problem in isolation. Um, and so, you know, as a, as a scientist and someone who chose to study science, as, you know, as, as someone who really wanted to help discover solutions to problems or solve problems in some way, you know, the role of science in society is, you know, you can trace it back to, to many important points. And there was a uh, a document that was written by the Niver Bush in, in the 40s that really kind of led to this, this government contract, if you think of it, between you know, science and government as to what role science plays in government. And, and there, was a real, there was a real sort of intellectual boon in the post-World War II years when you know, science, if you think of it as, as playing different roles, right? You've got the, the the, the first quadrant, which is sort of the pure basic research, and, and if you think of Niels Bohr and the discovery of the atom is just kind of intellectual curiosity-driven research, and then the work of Pasteur being this kind of intersection of, of answering intellectual questions but being driven by larger societal questions. And then if you think of Edison as kind of the ultimate cannibalizer of other ideas to, to come up with products that are, that are truly useful to society, the role of science in our society and within our government, it's, it's huge. And there was an op-ed recently written um, by John Gertner in the New York Times at the end of February that you know, took a look back at Bell Labs, which was a huge hub of innovation. I mean, they did everything from you know, the, the, the basic uh, structure of, of how cell phones work and satellites and solar panels. I mean, there was so much amazing innovation that came out of this one lab in New Jersey that, you know, it really 
help define who we are as a country in many ways. And I think when it comes to an issue like climate change, because it's connected directly to infrastructure and, and risk and communication and energy, that we're going to have to really rely on science to solve some of, some of it. Because we haven't, we know, we know what we need to do, but we don't have all of the answers yet. And it, it's actually going to take you know, a sort of the, the, the blessing of, of, of the government in, in many ways to, to, to sort of follow the lead and, and do the research that needs to be done to essentially scale renewable energy um, and, and bring it down to a price that's affordable. And, and, and it's, it's not going to happen unless there's, there's major investments made or if, um, you know, alternatively or in addition, a price tag is put on carbon dioxide in some way. So the role of, of of science and, and how it intersects with government is, is a really big part of this discussion. And then an, another part of it, I'll, I'll show you some public polling research, but it, it, it's also communication and, and journalism and, and how we treat this as a story. And, you know, this is, I guess, maybe the idealist in me looking back and, and pointing to a founding father who basically said, whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. And, and journalism, um, as, as much as we've seen lots of different manifestations of it. Um, journalism was essentially meant to be a way to inform the public and, and you know, really be a fundamental pillar of a participatory democracy, right? And so how we communicate this issue of climate change, as an example, is, is also very much linked to how journalism works in, in our country. So let's talk about seeing us. We're going to talk about seeing different aspects of climate change, but let's first start with us. And uh, this is actually a graphic that a student of mine uh, made. I, I teach a class at, at Princeton called Communicating Climate Change, where we cover the science and then we cover journalism. And, and we teach the students how to essentially be science journalists. And one of uh, my students was actually a psychology major, and she was really interested in how, as humans, we approach risk and how we essentially approach climate change. And I, I always found this really interesting. And that is, okay, if you think of the human brain, right, you've got the amygdala, which is sort of the, the ancient brain. Some folks refer to it as the reptilian part of our brain, the really old part of our brain. That It's very much fight or flight. It's how we assess, assess risk and how we assess threats. And it's it sort of makes very, very quick decisions and Things like a gun to the head or a stampede of elephants, or that's the kind of thing that the amygdala uh, basically responds to. Climate change, like I said, melting ice sheets. These are these are not images that our amygdala perceives as as risks or threat, right? So that that makes it hard, just from the way we're wired, to to perceive this issue well. You could argue that the part of our brain that really makes us human is the frontal cortex. That's the part of our brain that assesses risk, uh, takes in information. It's the rational part of our brain. It can look out over long periods of time. And in a way, that's the part of our brain that can look at an issue like climate change, look at it thoughtfully, and, and then begin to do sort of the long-range thinking and say, this is a problem that is really, really important, right? But it's you know, it, it's not necessarily well equipped when when compete com it can't compete as well with the amygdala, if you will. So that's kind of just part of the way we're wired, right? Now, I want to present some public polling research for those of you who've kind of been following how Americans have perceived climate change over the years. As a climate scientist, I like to just put all of the data together, and this is a, a graphic that was made by. Um, uh, social scientist at Stanford, and I think it does a really nice job of just showing the range of different polling results, right? It's it's kind of always hard. You get a new poll and you think that, you know, is this really the state of the art of, of polling? But I think it's better to look at it all together. And what this shows you is that when Americans are asked the question, do they believe in global warming? Do they agree with the statement that the earth is warming up? It ranges from anywhere to about 79% to 49%, depending on how the question is asked. And I think that it's also kind of interesting to point out that the Gallup, one Gallup poll shows low and 
literally the same organization has another poll that, that shows that belief in global warming to be high. So there's a range. And I think it's just useful to, to acknowledge that depending on how you ask the question, there's a range. But all in all, about 50% or more of Americans believe that global warming is real. Now, if you take each of those individual polls and you plot them over time, which is what climate scientists like to do, lots of data over long periods of time, literally the same question being asked by each group over time, starting in January of 2006 going to 2010, you know, again, kind of realizing that there's a range in the responses. One thing that's interesting is that each of these polls capture a decrease, right? So, you know, regardless of the fact that there's a, a range in, in beliefs, all of them are saying that, you know what, something happened between here and here where people's belief in the issue changed. And that's, that's statistically significant. Now, there's been numerous studies that have come out recently trying to attribute uh, the cause for that decline. And, you know, answers vary, but things like cold winters, uh, kind of making people change their minds, uh, lack of political leadership, you know, failure of cap and trade, the economy, uh, all of these things have, have basically played some kind of role. But, but overall, the, the, the truth is that over the past two or three years, we've seen a decline in public concern about the issue. Now, another way to look at, at us when it comes to climate change is uh, a, a series of, of polls done by folks at Yale and George Mason called the six Americas. And basically what it tells us is that you can think of America as falling into one of six buckets. Ranges from the alarmed to the concerned to the cautious, the disengaged, the doubtful, and then on the end, the dismissive. And from a, a social science point of view, because that's really what we're talking about right now, the folks on either extreme, these are the, the folks that we think of as the issue public, the folks that you know are going to call up their congressman and say, you know what, I really care about this issue. You need to do something about it or, you know, or the opposite. Okay. Now you can kind of simplify it even more and say, really, there's three Americas. There's the folks who are al alarmed or concerned. And really, if they could ask a global warming expert one question, they wouldn't ask them about the science. They, they really just want to know what can we do to stop it? How do we fix the problem? That's really the question that they want answered. Folks in the middle are still kind of on the fence. They, they want to understand why they should care about the issue. You know, I've got tons of things going on in my life. You need to explain to me why this matters to me where I live right now. Because the other thing about climate change is that a lot of Americans think of it as a problem that happens to other people on faraway timescales. Like it just on timescales that don't matter and, and not here where I am right now. Folks on the end, the, the doubtful and the dismissive, they actually have trust issues. Um, they, they don't trust scientists, they don't trust climate scientists, and they don't trust the data. And so the question that they need answered is, how do we know it's real? You know, and so from a communication standpoint, you know, the first thing you learn is know your audience. And it's really important to know what questions need to be answered to, to which groups. So I, I'm, I'm a climate scientist. I'm, I'm showing you a lot of research now that comes from the social science side of things, just because I guess over the years I've realized that communicating an issue is, is it's sort of a, a whole different kind of science. And, and I've been introduced to the whole suite of social science literature and research out there on the topic of persuasion. There is a great book, I guess sort of the, 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 the number one book to, to go to when you're thinking about persuasion research. Um, it's a book called The Rational Public and talks about, you know, how do you, how do you communicate a, an issue in such a way that it actually changes people's minds or, or it, it teaches people something that you think is, is critically important. And there's several steps that you need to go through. There's exposure to the issue, knowing that someone's actually paying attention to it, comprehending, understanding the issue, accepting it as, as true, and then finally retaining it and, and internalizing it in such a way that it actually changes your behavior in some way. And, you know, persuasion is, is a, a field of, of science, essentially, that, you know, that starts with something as simple as just Coca-Cola advertisers, right? All they really want to do is expose you 
to an ad in the hopes that it will, in some remote part of your brain, just shift you slightly to you know, selecting their product when you go to make that kind of quick decision. With an issue like climate change, uh, an issue like health, smoking, uh, trans fats in your foods, risk communication like that, that actually requires a whole different level of, of education. You, you've got to go through all of these different steps. And, and it, it actually takes a really, really long time. And this was one of the, the primary findings of, of the work that came out of this book was that over the long term, public opinion tends to change very slowly on, on big issues. And this is sort of another climate type of graphic in the sense that it runs over a very long time period from the 60s up to the 90s. And what this research essentially showed was that attitudes tend to protect themselves. In other words, it takes a long time to really affect culture, to, to change cultural values in, in some ways. And this is uh, a, a graph showing racial issues over time. And what it just makes the point of is that it, it, it's, it takes a long time for society to accept and change different things. And, and I show this to to illustrate that point, that, that attitudes protect, protect themselves, but also to say that there's some really important legislation that was passed in the 60s uh, you know, due to uh, a small group of, of vocal issue public, so to speak, who were really fighting for racial justice and racial equality and leadership at the federal level. So you know, it's, it's amazing to think that significant policy changes were made at a time when you know, the country itself might have still been working through certain issues. Now, if anyone, I don't know if any of you guys are reading Daniel Kahneman's new book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a really, it's a wonderful book that is essentially a nice summary of perception and, and, and how we make decisions and how our brain processes risks and, and things like that. And he works through a lot of these, these examples that, that come out of social science, which is selective affiliation is we tend to to think that people agree with us. So if, if on a survey you were asked, you know, how many people believe that trans fats are bad for you and you believe yourself the trans fats are bad for you, you'll basically say, I'd say probably about 60% or more. Whereas someone who doesn't believe that will also tend to think that a large number of people agree with them. So, so we have these tendencies within ourselves to, to think certain ways. Another is selective memory. We tend to remember things that we agree with. And so it sort of builds a, a, certain, a certain mode of, of thinking. And then finally, we tend to hang out with people who perceive things and, and agree with us, right? So all of these, these issues congregate in, in, our, in our headspace and, and lead us to feel a certain way about issues, which is why attitudes tend to protect themselves. So OK. Back to climate change, that was kind of a, a little detour into social science. When you look at concern about the issue of climate change, right, and, and, and you know, from a, from a scientist's perspective, I'm going back to the point of that very first globe model run that I showed you, which was you know, why climate scientists are so worried about the issue, right? So if we go back to, okay, part of this is communicating the risks in such a way that it, it matches what scientists are so worried about to begin with, folks have studied what, what predicts concern for the issue. And what they found is that the single biggest driver of whether you will be concerned about climate change or not is whether you believe that it's caused by human activity, that, that climate change is a result of us, things that we do. And in this sense, the word belief is, or you know, when I use the word belief, it's, it's, it's actually a social science term. It, it's sort of meant to connect to just firmly held values. I believe this is true in, in, in that sense. Concern is also predicted by trust in what scientists say, belief that scientists agree, and the level of attention that people are paying to the issue. Right. So concern is, is driven by a couple of different things. Now, trust is a really big one. If you don't trust science or scientists, then this is, this is going to be an issue that, that you probably have a lot of, of, of issue with. Um, I show this graphic because I, I, I think for me it illustrates one of the things that I learned at the Weather Channel, which is the role that we play in society. This was a, a, a poll that was done to ask people, you know, what, what 
jobs do you admire? Turns out no one can beat a firefighter. That is, that is considered you know, sort of the, the, best, the best of the best. Scientist is actually right beneath that. So scientists are, are folks that, that most Americans hold in high esteem. Interestingly enough, journalist and actor kind of at the bottom of the list. And the list went down even further, actually. And, and um, according to the, the article, it said that the very bottom of the list were investment bankers. So, you know, one of the things that I, I tried to, to make the case at the Weather Channel was that, you know, look, climate scientists are actually not that different from, from meteorologists or, or firefighters in, in, this, in this way that what we're really ultimately trying to do is keep people out of harm's way. We're, we're literally just doing it on different time scales, you know, rather than running into a building that's on fire or giving you a hurricane forecast out two or three days. We're kind of looking out a couple of decades to the, or to the end of the century and, and issuing forecasts and warnings based on that. And so I guess one of the things that, that I feel like the trust issue really shows us is that we need to make it clear that we're more like firefighters and less like investment bankers. And sometimes in the press, that, that plays out in a very different way. Isn't that, yeah, isn't that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay, in terms of just polling around trust itself, you know, not surprisingly, climate scientists are right up there in terms of, of who folks trust. TV meteorologists um, are, are also up there. And believe it or not, your doctor is also seen as, as a trusted messenger. Do scientists agree? So I said concern is, is predicated on trust in scientists and a belief that they agree. Well, interestingly enough, polling shows that a lot of Americans still think that this is back in just last November, there's still a lot of disagreement among climate scientists. And, you know, really, this is an issue where there is tremendous agreement among, you know, 99 doctors uh, agree that you know, cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. It, it's sort of a, a very similar thing. But in the media landscape, there's been a lot of framing to, to, to sort of show it as a debate. And, and that actually really affects public opinion. So I also noticed, or I also mentioned, that um, coverage of the issue drives concern. So this is a, a recent study done by Bob Brule at Drexel University, where he basically just counted up the number of stories that were done by the big three networks over time. This goes back to 1986. and what it shows you is that there was kind of a, a golden period in sort of the 2006, 2007 time frame where coverage was really significant. And, and if you remember back to the public polling that I showed you, that was sort of when we had kind of the peak of, of you know, concern about the issue. And, and 2008 was when we really started to see that decline. Well, it, it definitely corresponds to a, you know, a drop in media coverage as well. And, that, oops, the numbers for 2011 basically hasn't been this bad of coverage in, unless you, until you go back to 2003. So, you know, we've really seen a drop in media coverage. Now, part of that is the, you know, just the economy. It's, it's the fact that there's competing stories, important stories that need to make it onto the news. Um, climate change is, is one of these issues that, you know, in this 24-7 news cycle, it's like, What's new? What, what kind of new thing do you have to tell me about climate change? Well, you know, it's still getting warmer is not a great headline, right? It, it's, so it's a tough story to report on. And at the same time, though, the media landscape is changing dramatically. We've seen a lot of cuts, especially in science journalism. Um, and, you know, right now, TV networks have about half the staff that they had in the 1980s. There, there was a, a, a terrific FCC report that came out this past summer that just looked at all of the ways in which the media landscape is changing. Some ways it's changing in, in really interesting, healthy ways. And then, you know, other aspects kind of get back to our quote from Thomas Jefferson that just, you know, force us to ask, are, are we really informed at the level that we need to be? So I want to transition into the science part now a little bit. And basically, the social scientists tell us that if, you, if you're going to talk about climate change, you actually need to talk about four things. Um, and you need to talk about all four of them at the same time. You can't skip and that is you've got to work through for folks whether it's real, proof that it's real, proof that it is indeed us. This is the human connection part. You've, you've got to make that connection for people. 
you've also got to prove why it's a threat. Because if it's not a threat, then why should I be worried about this, right? I've got enough things to worry about. But then finally, and this is a, a mistake that I think a lot of scientists make, is we don't actually talk about how we can fix it. And for Americans, if you don't give us a solution to a problem, don't talk to us about the problem, right? You, you've got to give us some hope that we can actually solve it and, and give, us, give us some tools that we can, that we can work on. So you've really got to work through all, all four of those. So to start with, let's talk about how do you see climate. Now, when I was at the Weather Channel, I used to get asked a lot, you know, like, what actually is climate? And, you know, I, for me, believe it or not, this is climate. And, and my advisor in graduate school, actually, was the one who first pointed this out. There was a, a Jackson Pollock exhibit at the Met, and he came back, and he's like, you know, I was standing there, and I was just kind of thinking that Pollock was painting climate. And we were like, what the heck are you talking about? And he said, well, interestingly enough, Pollock painted standing up, right? And so he would pick a color, and then he would sort of walk down the canvas. And you would have these in, you know, immense canvases. And if there's any engineers in the audience, if you basically do a Fourier transform, if you pull out the wavelengths of all of the different colors, you basically get you know, all of these different frequencies, right? So a Pollock painting might look really messy, but it, it's, it's complex, right? There's a lot of complexity in there, and there's a lot of things going on to make the whole. And another way to think about climate is to think of it like an orchestra, right, where you've got all of these different instruments playing, and a lot of those, in, you know, those, those instruments fundamentally are, are Mother Nature, right? It's, it's the tilt of the Earth. It's our orbit around the sun. It's Milankovitch cycles, another word for that. It's, it's the growing and shrinking of ice sheets over time. It's things like El Nino that, that operate on these seven to 10 year timescales. You've got all of these different instruments playing, but then you add us to the mix, right? Now you've got this kind of steady drumbeat of, of human activity kind of adding to this painting. And the question then is, how do you pull out the part that's us and prove that, that we're actually altering the climate? Well, there's ways that you can do that. You know, and, and I started out in graduate school as someone who was studying a period called the Holocene, which the Holocene is the past 10,000 years. And if you think of this as a climate record of temperature going back 20,000 years, the Holocene marks the period where our climate becomes relatively stable. And I, I worked a lot on, on a society, an ancient civilization called the Akkadians, and we looked at you know, to what extent variability within the climate system could actually push a civilization into collapse. You know? And so when we study the Holocene, there's a lot of really interesting questions that come up because basically the Holocene started at roughly the same time that complex human civilizations first came onto the scene. And so there's this long-standing question within climate science is to what extent does complex human civilization require a fairly narrow envelope of variability so that so there's not too much change over too quick a period. Now, there's still a fair amount of change during during certain periods of the Holocene, but I, I think it's really important to just to highlight the fact that you know, there is natural variability within the system. We happen to come onto the scene at about a time when when variability shrank a bit. But within that that 10,000 years, we, we can look at periods where things either dramatically dried in certain regions. And in, in my work, working with the Akkadian civilization, we looked at, at drought and how drought played a role in the collapse of, of that civilization. And if any of you guys have ever read Jared Diamond's wonderful book, he, you know, he, he really showcases the fact that climate does play a role. And I think as scientists, we probably haven't talked enough about natural climate variability. And, you know, and I think it is really important up front to say, look, Mother Nature has a ton of, of variability in her back pocket. You know, there's a lot of things that she's thrown at us over the years. But that's not to say that, that it doesn't mean that climate change is not important. It's just to say that we're not special. We've, we've went through hard times in the past that have really done us in, in some cases. And, and we're now talking about a problem that kind of speeds up that change over, over a faster period. So... As you, as you begin then to move from Mother Nature and, and natural climate variability into how we may have played a role, I like to show this, this picture here that I got from a colleague, Richard Somerville. This gentleman in the oil painting is Svante Arrhenius, and he was one of the first 
scientists to actually work on the problem. And, and what, was, what he was intellectually interested in, talking about that first quadrant of, of research, he was interested in understanding why ice ages happened. And he was literally one of the very first people to come up with the notion that carbon dioxide kind of acted like a thermostat, that if you turned up carbon dioxide or turned down carbon dioxide, it was kind of like fiddling with the temperature of the planet. And he did the very first back of the envelope calculation to, to basically get at what would happen to the Earth's temperature if we doubled or halved carbon dioxide. You know, and, and he was doing this research in the 1890s. And, and like I said, the, 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 the driving intellectual curiosity was ice ages. But he was doing this work at a time when the Industrial Revolution was kind of first starting. And he's like looking out and seeing these, these steam turbines and, and realizing that you know, we're burning these fossil fuels. And so he, he did the calculation that said, OK, you know, if we doubled the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, it would probably warm up about eight degrees. This is like kind of the first climate model that he did by hand, essentially. Now, what was interesting was that you know he wasn't he wasn't perfect in the sense that he then thought that well, you know, given a linear population growth rate, not a good assumption, uh, it's going to take at least three thousand years for carbon dioxide to double. And uh, you know, honestly, it's a little bit too cold anyway, so it's probably a good thing. And so he was just like, yeah, you know, don't worry about that global warming thing. And you know, he, he made a tremendous contribution, but it, it took some more work to kind of refine his original thinking. And this gentleman, Bert Bolin, who went on to call for the creation of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, he was the one who said, you know what, I have a feeling that uh, Svante Arrhenius had some, some bad assumptions. And he basically then redid some of the calculations and said, you know what, I predict that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will probably increased by about 25% by the year 2000. And he was ultimately proved right. So, you know, it, it's more or less to say that global warming is a problem we've actually been working on since, you know, the, the 1800s, if not earlier. And there's been a lot of refinements made over time, and we've learned a lot during that century. So, you know, there's, there was this notion that, that carbon dioxide acts like a thermostat. Then, David Keeling at Scripps in San Diego was the one who said, you know what, I am going to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. He said, you know what, I, I'm going to build an instrument. He built an instrument called a mass spectrometer, and he stuck it out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on, on the Hawaiian island and in a, in a pristine place where it wouldn't be contaminated by things like pollution. And he began measuring carbon dioxide, and he, he saw that it was going up. The sawtooth component is actually the seasonal cycle. It's the earth essentially breathing, dropping leaves and, and, and flowering back in the spring and releasing and, and, um, and soaking up carbon dioxide. You know, he basically showed that we've been steadily tracking up. The other thing that he did, and I, I, I feel like as scientists, we haven't necessarily done a good job of, of explaining this, is that he also was able to chemically fingerprint the carbon dioxide. So he, he didn't just show that there was a trend. He also said, you know what? There's different isotopes of carbon. And so I can chemically fingerprint the carbon. So there's C12, C13, and C14. A fossil fuel is obviously made out of fossils, so it's super old, which means that the radioactive isotopes of carbon, C13 and C14, are both completely gone. So the, so fossil fuel-based carbon dioxide has a unique chemical fingerprint. And he was able to basically show that the growth in carbon dioxide was in part the result of burning fossil fuels. And the, the way we've essentially been able to boil it down is that our atmosphere today, about one out of every four molecules of carbon dioxide was put there by us. And Keeling was one of the folks who figured out a way to fingerprint it and, and tie it back to us. So let's talk about how we begin to see some of this change. Now, I gave you one, one way that we were able to connect climate change to human activity to us. There's another way we do it. In fact, there's a whole science called detection and attribution science, and we actually use climate models to be able to do this. And really, 
you know, it it's a lot like a stock in the stock market and and trying to understand you know is is my stock going up or down is it you know is it is there a long term trend going on here and and really detection is to say and am I seeing an actual trend or am I just seeing a cycle? And so you can use a climate model to just see if Mother Nature creates trends on her own. And so if you run really long timescales of, like you basically run a thousand years of a climate model, you try to find periods where there was an ever increasing trend and, and Mother Nature on her own does not create trends. The other question then is, is attribution. You know, how do we know that it's actually us? So what we try to do in our sort of second Earth, in our, our twin Earth that, that we call a climate model, is we try to recreate observed global surface temperatures. So here's the observed temperature record starting in the 1870s going up to today. And basically what you see is period of, of warming and kind of like a, a cooling and then another period of warming. 1970s is when we really see the trend take off. This part here, there's, there's some interesting reasons as to why it sort of leveled off. But ultimately, you, you test your model by seeing if you can recreate the real world, right? So the first thing you do is you run your model with just Mother Nature, with only natural forcing. So things like the sun, things like volcanic eruptions, things like El Nino. And you're trying to recreate this black line. So you run your climate model. Your climate model is the red line. So when you run a climate model that only has Mother Nature in it, essentially, you can't recreate a trend. On its own, Mother Nature does not produce a trend. OK, so now let's run that model. Let's only run it with greenhouse gases. OK, so you remember that black line? It kind of did this. Now, when you run a climate model with only greenhouse gases, with only our fingerprint, you get one big, long trend. So that doesn't look right either. So it's not strictly that humans are the loudest instrument in this orchestra. It's, it, it doesn't work out very well when you only have us. So it's not just us. So now you combine Mother Nature and the greenhouse gas signature, and here's our new red line. So that's a pretty good fit to reality. That, that gives you a sense that, that what you've got in your model is capturing the physics of the real world. And what we know is that ocean circulation changed in this time period, and, and the oceans actually kind of cooled a bit. So Mother Nature sort of swamped out the global warming signal a bit. Also, sulfate aerosols sort of added to the, to the mix and helped cool the, the atmosphere a bit. But um, the only way to really recreate observed temperatures is through a combination of natural variability and greenhouse gases. So that's sort of the classic attribution, saying that you can connect global warming to human activity. And, and this kind of statistical study, it falls straight from epidemiology. So the same kind of research that's done you know, when you do an autopsy on someone who's died to sort of attribute, OK, this person died of lung cancer. To what extent did smoking cigarettes contribute to cause of death? It, it's the same kinds of statistics that we use. So, you know, I like I said when I was at the Weather Channel, I used to get asked all the time, you know, what is climate? And I, I really think that Mark Twain said it best: climate is what we expect, weather is what we get. Right? So, it's important then to make the connection between climate, which really is, it's a statistical construct, right? Climate is just the average of weather over long periods of time. And connect it to what we see outside of our windows, right? Because if, if at the end of the day, you know, we need to be able to feel like we can see it in some way and to help people understand that. So interestingly enough, you know, the physics is fairly straightforward. If you take the average temperature of the planet and you warm it by about what we've done, about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, it basically shifts this entire curve. And what it means is we're going to be seeing more heat extremes. And it also means that because it's warmer, means that the atmosphere can hold more moisture, we're going to be seeing more precipitation extremes. So climate change, by definition, piles up in the extremes. We expect to see more extreme weather 
events of certain varieties. And we have been. We have actually been seeing that. So here's observational data, right? So here is temperature since 1895 in the United States, right? And so what do we see? A nice sort of uniform signal in this part of the country of warming. But it's, it's, not, it's not perfect. Global warming, unfortunately, is a phrase that sort of sounds like, well, the globe is uniformly warming. But all that means is when you average it all together, it's warming. In fact, in the U.S. Southeast, we've actually seen some, some localized cooling. And, and that's to be expected. You know, it, it's not a perfect system. You've still got all of this natural variability in play. But across the board, there is a very significant shift towards warming in the U.S. Now, we can also see it in precipitation. So this is temperature. Red means hotter. And this is rainfall. Interestingly enough, since 1895, the eastern half of the country has actually gotten wetter and the western half has gotten drier. Very consistent picture that we see in climate models. The U.S. Southwest, fastest growing part of the country, is, is drying out as we move forward in time. So it's, you know, it's a forecast. It's a forecast for the future. Now, what this means is also connected to the extreme. So this graphic here basically shows the percentage change in very heavy precipitation. So basically what climate scientists say is that because it's getting warmer, moisture in the atmosphere is greater, when it rains, it can rain heavier, we're actually seeing rain in a, in a slightly different way. When it rains now, it rains harder over shorter periods of time. And you can regionalize that. In the Northeast, for example, we've seen a 67% increase in what we, can, what we call these very, ha very heavy rainfall events, the you know, six or seven inches in an hour kind of thing, the kind of thing that sets records. And that is a very, a very clear signal that we expect. Now, what that also means is that it doesn't mean that every place is going to get wetter. You know, it, it's sort of the rich get richer and the poor get poor in the sense that the U.S. Southwest, which doesn't get very much rain to begin with, is going to see those rain storms. Seasonality was, is going to shift, and, and the amount of rain that we see at any given time is, is going to shift. So overall, it's going to be less, but also the way in which it falls is going to change. So we are very much already able to see this fingerprint of more extreme 2011, for, for those of you who've been keeping track, set a new record for the number of billion dollar weather disasters, basically $14 billion weather disasters. Um, it's expensive. You know, there was a, a hearing recently on the Hill. President of the Reinsurance Association basically said, you know, from our industry's perspective, you know, it's there. You know, we we've got to pay these these policies and, and we're seeing a shift across the board. So, you know, the insurance folks definitely get it. Um, now, I think it's also, again, really important to say climate isn't the only thing that's going on here. We've, we've got a lot more people in harm's way. We've got a lot more stuff that can get hurt as well. So it's, it's that combination. And, and you know, this kind of goes back to you know, civilizations in the past. It's to say that, look, things have happened. You know, we've had bad weather in the past, but now the risk is increasing. The vulnerability is increasing. This plays out at the global level as well. Munich Re just released the, the latest data, and basically you know, we've seen just an increasing number of extreme weather events around the world. And you know, from the insurance sector standpoint, very, very expensive to, to manage. And, and you know, the questions then become policy questions. How do we manage these risks? So to begin to sort of wrap up the science side of this, and, and one way to sort of help you see what climate change looks like from the extreme weather standpoint, there was a, a really nice study done based on the European heat wave. If you remember back to the European heat wave of 2003, you know, hottest summer since about 1500, we saw, you know, temperatures of like 104 in Paris, things that people had never really seen before, and it lasted a very long time. So this, you know, falls straight from climate models where we expect heat waves to become more frequent, more intense, and more long-lasting. So scientists asked the question, okay, given that, that we believe that from the physics, how likely did human activity influence the European heat wave, right? You can actually do a weather autopsy 
And, and that's what they did. They, they recreated the European heat wave of 2003 in their model. And what they found was that human influence at least doubled the chances of summers as hot as the one Europe saw in 2003, okay? So what that shows you is, okay, look, there's a lot of things going on in the climate system. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complex beast, but human activity actually doubled the chances of it happening. So just like a standard poker analogy applies here. But then they ran that model out in time. And I think this is sort of where you can begin to see what climate change means and why climate scientists are so concerned about it. And that is, by 2040, the 2003 type summer will be happening every other year. And by 2070, the European summer of 2003 becomes a relatively cool summer. So the thing about climate change that's really tricky is that by the time you really, really see it, it's too late to fix. And so as a society, a trust in science, a trust in, in, in how we do science becomes critical to deciding whether or not to do something about this issue. Because you know, there's a whole phenomenon called the wait and see approach, which seems like a very rational approach, right? That you know, first we should wait and see how bad it gets to decide whether it's really bad or not. But the problem is, is if you do that, it's going to be even worse. And you know, the, the tricky thing about climate change as well is that you know, when, you, when you prevent and when you basically invest in resiliency and you invest in infrastructure to protect yourself from downstream risk, it's actually cheaper than doing it after the fact. But again, you kind of go back to our brains and the way our brains work. And you know, until we can kind of shift to that prefrontal cortex side of the brain and assess risks that way, we're kind of left with the, you know, the, the, the Katrina-like story, right? Which was scientists had been saying you know, 20 years beforehand, look, we've got an incredibly vulnerable place. Can't tell you when that Cat 3 hurricane is going to hit, but it's going to hit at some point. And so the sooner we do something, the better off we are. You know, it, it's tough. It's, you know, it's tough to gather the will to do something in advance of, of something like that. So Miles Allen, a professor at Oxford, rewrote Mark Twain's statement to say, climate is what you affect and weather is what gets you. And I think that's the way you can begin to see climate change is, is you're going to see it in extreme weather. So, okay. I am going to wrap up with just talking a little bit about solutions. But first, I think it's actually really important for the Simpsons to encapsulate what this is all about, because no one does it better. Math done. Pine cone collected. Permission slip signed. Now time for a break. A little social studies. <laughs> what will Springfield be like in 50 years? Let's see what the computer says. That's horrible. What else? Oh, my God. <gasps> it just gets worse and worse. And now, Ralph Wiggum will read his essay on Springfield in 50 years. <clears throat> in 50 years, the vacuum cleaner will be quiet and not scary. Next, we have Lisa Simpson. Oh, Ralph, how I envy your optimism. There is no Springfield 50 years in the future. With global warming trapping the CO2 inside our poisonous atmosphere, our superheated oceans will rise, drowning our lowlands, leaving what's left of humanity baking in deserts that once fed the world. And in the new Nineveh, darkness falls. Lisa, your outburst was either a sign of deep emotional imbalance or a passionate response to a sobering truth. Luckily, the treatment for both is intensive therapy. What's therapy going to do for me when the world is in ashes? Oh, I don't know. But when you go, could you return this Sports Illustrated for me? Someone must have uh, uh, put it in my bag. They do that, you know. They're always putting things in my bag. Well, 
off to school where they'll prepare our little minds for a future we'll never see. Sounds like someone's got a case of the Mondays. Hmm? <laughs> I'm going to Disneyland. See trees of green where roses too. I see them bloom for me and you, and I think to myself, What a wonderful world! But in my concurrent adventure, I learned a really important lesson you can't wallow in despair. Face things as they really are. And that is simply to say that, yes, we have to talk about solutions and how we fix it and, and not end with the, you know, <laughs> and then. So from the solution standpoint, you know, as a nerdy scientist, I'll say that we, you know, we divide it into two different buckets, essentially. We've got just reducing emissions, which is more or less saying, you know what, our energy infrastructure has to be changed. We have to admit that there are other things outside of fossil fuels and that we need to invest in them and we need to find ways to incorporate them into our energy infrastructure. The other is adaptation, which is to say, you know, and you know, I think the short answer is as a country, we kind of neglected our infrastructure for a really long time. I mean, you look at a city like New York and Philadelphia where certain aspects of their infrastructure is 100 years old. I mean, that that's just, you know, we, we've got to admit that, that as a society, we need to invest in that infrastructure. It's really critical. And so adaptation, you know, is really just the infrastructure bucket. And it's saying, you know what, you know, there's going to be other stuff that we're going to have to deal with in the pipeline um, that, that's, that's going to hurt us if we don't acknowledge it and, and prepare for it. So to give you a little bit more background on the... Bouncer. I'm going to skip the the video. I'll, I'll invite you to go to climatecentral.org, our website. We've got some, some videos up on, on adaptation, on, on what different cities are doing, trying to you know, adapt and, and, and you know, fight the big fights that, that need to be put into place when you're planning like a city like Miami is for sea level rise. When it comes to the mitigation part, like I said, it's, it's really just accepting the scientific fact that as a result of, of understanding the science of global warming, we've come to realize that the decision that we made you know, about 200 years ago to invest in a fossil fuel infrastructure has downstream impacts. I mean, that, that's one way of, of describing global warming is just to say, well, we realize that using fossil fuels as our primary energy source has some negative aspects associated with it. And, and how, do we, how do we remedy that? How do we remedy the fact that that, mis that, that choice has negative side effects, you know, and, and I think when you then begin to look at, at, again, this larger question of, you know, we just passed 7 billion, we're headed towards 9 billion people on the planet, and we're going to need more energy, how do we do that? How do we do that responsibly? How do we do that in such a way that 100 years from now, we can't recognize anything because the climate has changed so much? And, you know, this is more or less just, you know, from, from the math standpoint, you know, right now we use about 15 trillion watts, 15 terawatts of energy. By 2050, we're going to need pretty much to double that. And if we double it only with fossil fuels, you know, and there's a lot of discussion right now about natural gas and, you know, and some of the, the, the aspects of natural gas that makes it better than coal. But the bottom line is, is that if we use fossil fuels as our primary source of energy, we're not going to be able to recognize our homes, you know, 50 to 100 years down the road. Like that, that's just, that's, that's the byproduct of that decision. You know, and, and one of the jobs of science is to show you the outcomes of your decisions, the risks and, and, and outcomes of, of, of the decisions that we make. So, you know, that's the challenge. Okay, how are we going to generate 30 trillion watts of energy? And, you know, are we going to do it only with fossil fuels or not? If we care about the climate, um, then we will decide to approach our energy choices in, in specific ways. And, and I think, you know, the big takeaway is that there are no silver bullets. So in the solutions um, part of this story, it ain't easy. Uh, it ain't all done yet. It's hard to do when there's no price on this thing called carbon because, you know, if you want to drive markets, if you want to drive technology and innovation, you've 
kind of got to incentivize it. And if you don't have a price on the thing that's not good, then it's sort of hard for anyone to respond and care about it. So that, that's, that's where the government kind of does come back into this. And you know, I talked to a lot of folks, you know, small business owners in the Midwest who are interested in renewables, but there's no market clarity. There's no market incentives. There's no policy clarity, and it's really hard to drive growth when, when you know, nobody's telling you you should care about it. So you know, one point is that there are no silver bullets. The other point is to say that it just means that there's going to be a lot of ways to slice the pie and a lot of different ways to address it. And I will say that energy efficiency, we just need to love it a whole lot more than we do. Like, energy efficiency is such a great way to embrace energy infrastructure and, and solving different environmental problems. But it just, it ain't sexy, you know? And I was talking about it with some folks today that, you know, when the president advised people or encouraged people to keep their tires inflated, he got so beat up about it, you know? And it's just like, when is it, what happened that we are, like, we don't embrace efficiency, you know? It's just, why is that? And this sort of gets back to the question of, of just, our culture, you know, and and what is it that's so wrong about being efficient? You know, and how do we make efficiency as sexy as it should be? Um, and I, I'll just end by saying, you know, when I was at the Weather Channel, I felt like obviously our main goal was to help keep people out of harm's way. You know, we we were, you know, we we were really in high gear during extreme weather events. But there's a lot of time when the weather's actually really nice, and I was always like, but you know. There's good aspects to the weather. We focus so much on the tornadoes and the hurricanes, and everybody knows where Tornado Alley is and, and where hurricanes strike, but we never talk about all the good stuff related with weather and the fact that in our country we have you know, just this massive region of tremendous solar wealth. We have essentially a wind belt that stretches from Texas all the way up to the Dakotas. Like There's tremendous natural weather resources that we don't really give enough attention to and incorporate into the weather. The, the weather really is energy in many ways. And this is just, you know, I, I showed you the math before of the fact that we're going to have to get to 30 trillion watts of energy per year by 2050. When you break that down from a, a renewables portfolio, globally, the sun gives us about 600 terawatts. I mean, if, if you know, and this is a, a statistic you may have heard, if we, draw, if we basically create a 100 mile by 100 mile square in the US Southwest, that's three terawatts of energy. That'll give us everything that we need. I mean, so is the infrastructure there? Is it to scale? No. I mean, is there science work that needs to be done? Absolutely. And if, if we don't invest in that, it, it ain't going to get done. And you know, when you talk to the solar folks, they kind of hate it when you just say 100 by 100 miles square, because the whole point is, is not to build a massive array. It's, it's to say, you know, use rooftops, use available space in your own backyard. Decentralized energy is is kind of you know homegrown you know what that's kind of what we're talking about but you know from from that standpoint solar is has got tremendous potential and you know wind globally two to four terawatts can come from the wind here in the U.S. like I said we've got tremendous natural resources about a half a terawatt can be generated biomass it's the same thing globally you know we can generate about one to two terawatts from biomass and liquid fuels are really important. I mean, it's, liquid fuels are a really important part of the equation. So anyway, it's, it's just to say that there's, there's renewables out there, um, and there's a lot of them. It's just a question of whether we're going to invest at the rate that we want to. You know, and, and interestingly enough, other countries have decided that, that that's an area of growth for them. So you know, culturally, again, it's a question for us. So tribute to a man who just died on Saturday, Sherry Rowland, who received a Nobel Prize for his discovery of the ozone hole and the chemistry of the upper atmosphere um, that created the ozone hole. Sherry was a great man, um, and one of his many great sayings was the following, what's the use of having developed a science well enough to make predictions if in the end all we're willing to do is stand around and wait for them to come true? That's, I think, the, the real challenge. So I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I'll invite anyone who's interested to check out our website at Climate Central for more information. We've got videos, and you know, we, we, we write um, and report regularly on climate and energy issues. So check it out if you get a chance. And I think if you guys are up for it, there's time for questions if anybody has any questions. Yeah, thanks.